How many can say that they have been blessed by the ministry of BTI? How many have ever been to BTI before? Those are good odds. <laughs> how many have how many have ever been to BTI? Good. Then you know with me that it is such a blessing. You know that BTI is an important part of the Church of God. It, te it teaches us how to worship God, how to, how to work for God, and to be His church. It teaches us more about, it, about His doctrine. It helps us to learn which way to go. We can't just go any direction we want. we got to go the Bible way. And BTI teaches us the Bible way. I'd like to share with us the, uh, the statistics that, that came from BTI this past year, mainly because at state convention I accidentally got some of the numbers wrong. That's part of the reason I was going across the state. I wanted to make sure everyone knew the right numbers. <laughs> so for 2021, the Cleveland BTI had 108 students from 16 states in Canada. The combined totals of Spanish and English students was 58 in first term, 22 in second term, 19 in third term, and 9 in LPD. Alabama, Arkansas, and Tennessee tied for the number of students representing their state with 19 each. One student was sanctified, two received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, 20 were baptized in water, there were two divine healings, and four accepted a calling to preach, teach, missions. One specifically felt called to pastor. Praise the Lord. And I'd, I'd like to say, please make plans to be at BTI this year. If at all possible, go ahead and make plans. It's two months away. Uh, let's see, did I write the dates down? Uh, no, but I have them here. May 29th through June 11th of this year. So make plans to be at BTI. I want to make mention that a special honor will be given to the uh, most represented church in Tennessee this year. So if you, if you could be at BTI at all, right now is the time to go. We want to, we want to see the... Uh, Whenever I was thinking about doing this, a scripture came to mind that we've used for years. Uh, we've used it with CPMA, but I believe it'll fit right here. It's where in 1 Corinthians it says, Seek to excel to the edification of the body of Christ. When we go to BTI, we're learning how to excel to the edification of the body of Christ. We're edifying the church whenever we go to BTI. So right now is a good time to go to BTI. It's two months away and plans could be made still. So make plans. I'd like to also make mention of our uh, correspondence courses that come through headquarters. We have the Who Is She series, which is on our history, the Great Commission, the church, prominent teachings. We also have correspondence courses on the will of God, the grace of God, one fold, the works of the flesh, Christology, the church, the body of Christ, and a new one that came out, let's see, was it last year, on theocracy. We were talking about theocracy today in Sunday school. If there's anything we need to know, it's theocracy. We're not operating by any other government, but by the, by the government operated by God. We don't need any other government. If we have any man-made government, we've went somewhere wrong. We need God in the Church of God. We also have the Know Your Bible series, which is being, see, I believe they're reprints from the former organization on the Ten Commandments, Kings and Kingdoms of Israel, uh, the Seven Churches of Asia, the Fruit of the Spirit, the Church of God at Corinth, and the Book of Judges. But again, make plans to attend BTI in Cleveland. And if you haven't done any of these correspondence courses, be sure and do them. They they take you deeper in the Bible, and they help us learn more. We need to know more of the Bible. If we study for the rest of our lives, there is still more to know. God has more for us to know, no matter how deep we go. 
Our theme this year is pressing toward the mark. No doubt we've all seen the uh, the theme for this year. It's a picture of a of a tall mountain, and there's somebody standing before it, no doubt thinking about climbing that tall mountain. It in, it alludes to the fact that we have somewhere to be. It says we got to we got to press to get up there. Climbing a mountain is not easy. We got to press toward going there. If you'll turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, and we'll begin in verse 8 and work up to the theme verse in verse 14. Philippians 3 verse 8 says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Where are we, what are we pressing for today? Are we pressing for riches? Are we pressing for fame? All those things won't last forever. we got to press toward heaven. That's what Paul was pressing for. He was wanting that resurrection that's promised to all who are faithful in Christ. Christ was the first fruits of this resurrection, and we can follow Him if we, follow, if we, war, if we walk the way He walked. If we go the way He goes, we'll be in that resurrection. I want to be in that resurrection. It means I have to grab that which is grabbing me, being apprehended for that which I... If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. i got to get this thing, and it has to get me. God must be the center of our lives, and nothing else should take His place. We cannot look back to what we used to do. We can't look back to our old lives, or we may want to go back to it. It may start losing its ugliness, and we may start thinking, I want to go back to that. I miss those old things I used to do. I miss the fun I used to be in. But it's as much a sin now as it will be later. And it's as much a sin later as it has been. Please pray for me. Heaven is ahead for the saint of God, so press forward and don't go back. The Bible is our guidebook and leads us toward the mark of heaven. How close do we live to it? How close to the Bible are we living these days? Are we following it with all we know to do? Have we let anything slip back? We can't let anything slip back. There's a question I've been asking across the state, it is, and it's a weird one. I don't think I've ever heard it before, but it's the question, do we need a personal solemn assembly? Now, before I get into this, I know... I know by the uh, when I read Zechariah 13, 8, and 9 that we will not have a church-wide reorganization again. I feel confident in saying that. But what about the member? Have we erred in any way? Have we drifted away from God as the church had before? We don't need to let this be our we don't need to let this be our case. We need to press toward this mark of heaven. We don't need to turn back. We need to go toward God. Please read with me Joel chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Looking over the congregation, I don't believe that any of you are unfamiliar with what I'm about to talk about. You all look like seasoned Church of God members. But I'm going to talk about this to just remind us of some things. To remind us of where we came from and where we must stay away from. 
we got to go to heaven. We can't go back to what we used to do. We can't go back to this world of sin or else we'll stay with the world when God comes back. We can't go back to this stuff. Joel chapter 2, verse 15 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage to reproach, that the heathen should roll over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, Where is their God? We don't need it said in the church of God, Where is their God? We need the world to see the God that we serve. We don't need to look like everyone else. We need to be the church. God didn't design everyone else to look like the church. He designed us to look like the church. That means we got to do it. If we're going to be the church, we got to be the church. God called His people at that hour, and they obeyed. We're, we're standing or sitting right now in the place where God called a solemn assembly. He called His people to come out of what we were in, to come out of some things that were going on at that time. And those who were faithful obeyed that call. And if God is calling us now to come out of what we've fallen into, we got to obey it. we got to follow God out. we got to get out of whatever we're in if we're in something wrong. The solemn assembly was designed of God to bring repentance. It wasn't just a social meeting. It wasn't even just a religious meeting. It was designed to to bring true repentance, to, to bring a full turnaround from sin. There was sin in the church. It's an ugly thing to think about, but there was sin in the church. And God didn't want that. He doesn't want it now, and He didn't want it then. There had to be true repentance to be the church of God. And thankfully, there was. How about the member today? Are you where you need to be? I've... I don't know you personally, and I know God does. And I'd like to say that we're all doing good. I hope we're all doing good. I believe we are. But if we ain't, we need to be. If we have fallen away from God, we need a personal solemn assembly. That means getting in our prayer closet. That means praying to the Lord and saying, I'm sorry, I've went somewhere wrong. i got to get out of this. i got to live the way God wants me to live. That's what it takes to get right with God if we've fallen away. It's a scary place whenever we get out of the will of God. We don't want to be there. We don't want to live without the presence of God. It's, it's just not beautiful. It's ugly. Jeremiah 16 verses 9 through 11 talks about such a place. It talks about the place the church had gotten into when they had left their God. Whenever we had whenever we had said we want to go some way else, or when people in the church had been saying that. This is what happened. Jeremiah 16, 9-11, it says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes, and in your days, the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride. And it shall come to pass when thou shalt show this people all these things, and they shall say unto thee, Wherefore hath the Lord pronounced all this great evil upon, against us? Or what is our iniquity? Or what is our sin that we have committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law. And ye have done worse than your fathers, for behold, ye walk every one after the imagination of his evil heart, that they may not hearken unto me. Therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your, fa neither ye nor your fathers, and there shall ye serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor." I don't want to find my soul in that kind of a place. I don't want to be where the presence of God is not. 
I don't want to be where joy and gladness is no more. Where it doesn't sound like the church of God anymore. Where it doesn't feel like the church of God anymore. Where you don't hear that glorious doctrine that we preach. It's Bible doctrine. I don't want to find myself again in a place where I believe anything contrary to the Bible. I don't want to be in that place. God was not happy with it. And He let the church slip there to show us we were in the wrong. And He had to pull us out of that. If the soul finds himself in such a place, God has to pull him out. And if I find myself in such a place, I want to be pulled out. I want to be where the joy of the Lord is. I ain't saying that I'm always happy, but I want to be joyful. (laughs) God will not bless sin and backsliding. I don't want to go back. God won't bless it. He will not bless it. He never blessed Israel whenever they backslid. And He won't bless the church of God if we backslide. We don't need to go back. Going backward is not pressing toward the mark. I got an illustration that came to my mind whenever I was preparing this. It's about it's a football illustration, and I don't know barely anything about football, but I thought I'd share it anyway. Jim Marshall, the Vikings' defensive end in 1964, was playing in a very... Uh, it was a game where you thought they had it in the bag. You thought they were going to win it. He had just caught he just caught it from a fumble, and he was running toward the end zone. He was about to get home. He crossed the end zone and found out he ran for the 49ers end zone. When he got there, a team a team member for the 49ers ran up, pat him, patted him on the arm, and said, "Thanks, Jim." <laughs> when we get to the end of the way, do we want the devil running up to us and and say, "Thanks, your name"? I don't want that. I don't want to run for the devil thinking I've run for God. I don't want to go in a wrong direction. We're not pressing toward the mark when we're pressing toward the world. And when we press toward the world, we're pressing for the devil. I don't want to press for the devil. It means i got to do what God wants me to do. i got to live the way He wants me to live. That's the only way to make heaven, doing what God wants us to do. We got to live that way. We got to do everything he wants us to do. I got one more scripture in Revelation 21 verses 1 through 4. This place we're pressing toward heaven, it's going to be a beautiful place. Sin will never be in there. I'm looking forward to it, ain't you? Yeah. Revelation 21, verses, starting in verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I, and I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. I'm looking forward to heaven. Nothing, that, nothing that's on earth will be up there. We, souls will be up there, but pain will not be up there. Sin will not be up there. Sorrow will not be up there. The very, the very memory of sin will be gone. I'm looking forward to that when the devil can't even stand at the gate and yell his temptations at me. Whenever temptations aren't even a memory anymore. That's a beautiful place to me where I can live for God and not worry, not not be concerned at all. Where we've worked all, where we've done everything here, we've got everything done. We've lived as we ought to live. We've got all the work done. We've pressed. There's a song that's out by the Kingsman right now. It's uh, called Still I Climb. There's a line in the second verse that I just love. It's saying just a few more steps and no more need to climb. 
we're coming to that place where we won't need to climb anymore. We've reached the top. We've reached heaven. We've got to the place where we're supposed to go. Our goal is heaven and perfection is the only way to get there. We got to get perfect. God called us there. We got to reach perfection, both as the individual and as the church. When we're living as we ought to live, we'll find ourselves in the, in the very image of Christ. I believe it's 1 John 3 when he says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll be living the way God wants us to live. We'll, we'll have pressed into his presence. We'll be pressed will be pressed and have pressed into that place God wants us to be. We'll be exactly where He wants us to be when He comes back. At least I want to be in that number that is in His presence. How do we reach perfection? We study, we pray, we change, and we preach. We got to get this thing in us. We got to do what we got to do. We got to study the Word. We gotta, we gotta pray. We gotta get this thing, and then if God tells us we're doing something wrong, we gotta change. We can't just let God tell us what we're doing wrong and then keep doing it. There's no repentance in that. You haven't truly repented unless you turn away from what you've been doing. And then we gotta tell the world the good news. We gotta tell them how we gotta tell them how we gotta how we gotta live to get there. We got to do this thing. We got to press toward heaven, press toward the mark. Let God's word carry you to that place. Let the Bible lead you all the way to heaven. There's nothing else that'll lead us to heaven. If the if we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't have anything to lean on. We would only have man's word to lean on if there wasn't no Bible. So we got we got to study this thing. We got to know it. Dig into the Word, study and live it, for there is no other way to live with God. Press toward the mark. Get this thing. If we want to live with God, we got to read His Word and know how to do it. I'm going to give us a time to pray. I don't know the I don't know the heart, but God does. I'd, again, I'd like to say we're all living exactly the way we know to. We're all doing as. We're all living in the light to the best of our knowledge and ability. God knows whether or not we are. I know for myself that I want to. I want to be in that place where I'm doing exactly what God wants me to do. Please join me in prayer and then I'll turn it over to our pastor.